Let's look at the so-called lesser Christian heresies of the early church that the early church ultimately condemned and refuted. Not the big ones like Unitarianism and Arianism and Modalism or Sabellianism. Those views are considered big in my view because they deny and attack the true identity of Jesus Christ. They water him down to a creation of God. They deny the true identity of the one true God. The Sabellians or modalists, for example, would try to argue that Jesus is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Son is the, incarn the, the incarnate one. He's still a creation, though, in their view. He still had a beginning. He's not the eternal Son of God. He's still a creation of God, subordinate to God, not equal with God, ultimately, in their view. So these different, uh, these different big heresies deny the true identity of God as eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they deny the true Jesus, and therefore there is uh, a, a very big burden on them. There's, uh, they're in danger of destruction, their soul being cast into hell for these very views. However, holding to these views that I'm about to uh, elaborate on as a more educational video, you need to be informed. You need to acquire wisdom as the book of Proverbs very often puts it you need it's 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 important not to be ignorant to accidentally fall into a, an early christian heresy these views don't necessarily deny the true identity of jesus christ because you can still hold to these views without uh denying the trinity without denying jesus as eternal son of god as true god from true god as the Son of God by nature, the, the uniquely begotten Son, therefore he has the same nature as God. You can still believe those things, but hold to uh, an unbiblical, heretical idea of his humanity. You're not necessarily damned to hell for believing in these things, but they are concerning. They are very important. You can hold to an unbiblical view of Christ's humanity, but God may overlook that in grace. He may forgive you of that because, again, perfect theology does not save you. But if you hold to these views that I'm about to elaborate on, it is very troublesome. It is, it's, it's very significant because it impacts the gospel itself. Because if you water down the humanity, the true and complete humanity of Jesus Christ, you've now affected the atonement. Because how can Jesus Christ be our mediator between God and men if he's not truly human? How can he represent us? How can he be your great high priest if he's not fully and completely human? If his humanity is watered down or reduced in some sense, then his, his very sacrifice is affected. The infinite value of his sacrifice on the cross, his atonement that he made for us on our behalf, is, is attacked, is impacted. So if Jesus was simply in a flesh suit, or he was simply appearing as a human being but wasn't completely human, or his, his humanity is watered down in some sense, the very value and beauty of the atonement of Jesus Christ's work on the cross is negatively affected. It's watered down. It's reduced. The value goes down because his death wouldn't be a real human death. Him giving his very life unto death, pouring out his his soul, his life unto death for the glory of the Father and to make atonement, drinking down the cup of God's righteous wrath against sin, that would be severely impacted. So it's important to know these heresies so you can avoid them. Whether you are guilty of them in ignorance or willfully, it's important that you know about these and you search the scriptures for the biblical answer. Now let's start with docetism or docetism, which is essentially the view that Jesus only appeared as a human being, but his flesh wasn't real. His human existence was an appearance. It was, it just looked that way. But in reality, he was basically in a phantom body. The term actually means to appear or phantom. So his body was basically a ghost. So this was connected to Paul's refutation of the Gnostics, where Paul would refute the idea that 
Jesus is uh, that Jesus only appears human being, but he's truly incarnate. His existence is bodily; it's fleshly; it's corporeal. corporeal. Next is Eutychianism, which basically denies the two distinct natures of Jesus Christ. The idea that his divine nature and human nature were mixed together. Instead of distinction in his natures as God and as human, he has two natures mixed into one new nature. So this denies the full and complete humanity of Jesus Christ. It almost teaches that he is like a superhuman rather than truly human like us. Right? I would say Jesus as Son of Man is equal to man in humanity, and Jesus as Son of God is equal to God in deity. And you see, it's it's vitally important to hold the view that Jesus is truly and completely human, and not to try to mix them together or blend them, because again, the atonement of Jesus Christ is affected. Apollinarianism was the view that Jesus was not fully human. So the idea, it's, it's kind of like Jesus in his pre-incarnate state as the eternal son would enter into creation and become human to a certain point, like put on a flesh suit, covering up his deity, disguising himself as a man, but not completely man. It is often tied in with the idea that Jesus, yes, had real flesh, he was physical, but his mind was actually a divine mind, not a human mind. But we know from scripture that he grew in wisdom and stature. He learned things. He learned things as life went on. So this is very clear in the Bible. How can he have only a divine mind if he learned things and grew in wisdom and stature? So it waters down, it waters down the complete humanity of Jesus Christ, because Jesus had a human soul, a human spirit, a human mind, human intellect, human capacities, a human body, human bones. And he went, he went through these genuine human experiences with a human mind. And lastly is Nestorianism, which is the view that Jesus Christ was two distinct persons. So it's kind of like the idea that the person of God the Son entered into creation, becoming another person, the human being, Jesus Christ of Nazareth on earth. And the, the saint Nestorius, it's rumored that he didn't literally believe in what I just described, but it's named after him for quite unknown reasons, I believe. So it results in the idea that Jesus Christ is schizophrenic, as if he has two uh, separate minds divided into two different persons or personalities. But the conclusion that the church made, and of course I acknowledge the simple fact that yes, these can be tough, these, you know, looking through the scriptures is vitally important, but it's it can be difficult to come to exact conclusions, but of course the church has concluded that Jesus Christ is one person united as one single person who who has two complete natures truly god and truly man so his two natures are united in one glorious person his two natures are not separated in one person or separated into two persons his human nature and his divine nature are not mixed together or conflated his mind was a human mind not a divine mind only and he did not simply appear in human existence, but he entered real human existence. And therefore, his death on the cross was a real death. His spirit left, right? His human spirit left his physical body on the cross. He died a real death. And we know that death is not cessation of existence. It's not entering into nothingness, but death is to do with separation. Not only was he separated from God on the cross, he broke fellowship with God the Father in a very real sense because 
He drank down the cup of God's wrath against sin. He bore the wrath of God on the cross, so he was separated from God in that sense. But his body and soul were also separate. But his soul continued, right? This is the same with us as Christians and non-Christians, of course. When you die, your soul leaves your body. Your soul, your body and soul are separated, but you, you're still conscious in your spiritual existence. You're still conscious. You still continue to exist as a spirit. And that is true of Jesus Christ. So when these Arians attack uh, the Trinitarian view of the incarnation and the death of Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, they say, God cannot die. It's impossible. He's immortal, so he cannot die. He cannot become mortal because that would contradict his uh, very definition of existence. But the simple answer is it's very easy for God Almighty to enter into his own creation, to appear and become human flesh, to receive upon himself, to add to exist his existence, not minus anything from his existence, to add to his existence, to add to his person, a genuine human existence, a genuine human mind and soul, and in that human existence, in that real experience, give his life, pour out his life unto death to show the greatest act of love. It's very easy for God Almighty to do this. Obviously, we're not saying that the immortal God died. We're not saying he died in his deity, that he died in his essential eternal nature, because that is literally impossible. But for that human being that God became, that human being was capable of death, and he chose to, to do that for us to show the greatest act of love and to atone for our sins. But these Unitarians forget the fact that death in the Bible, biblically defined, is separation. When Adam and Eve, uh, God told them, the day that you eat of the forbidden fruit, you will surely die. He said the day, but they didn't die physically. They died in a different way. They didn't die physically that very day. They lived on for a long time. But spiritually, right, the theory is, of course, it's open to interpretation, but spiritually they died, right? You could argue that they died in their sins. Their soul died the moment that they ate the forbidden fruit. But you could also argue they died in the sense of being separated from God. They were separated from his fellowship, his favor. They had to leave the Garden of Eden that very day, I believe. So death is separation. Death is not simply physical. It's not simply uh, physically dying, but it involves uh, the separation of body and soul and a separation of fellowship. So, of course, God in the flesh on the cross could die in that very definition. Now, as I stated earlier, these heresies that I just described I don't believe they are as bad or as damning as ones like Arianism or Unitarianism or Sabellianism. These ideas basically attack the humanity of Christ, but not the deity of Christ. But having an unbiblical or incorrect or even heretical view of something that is, yes, very significant, but is, you could kind of argue it's an in-house debate, but not quite, because it has been declared as heresy by the early church and the councils, especially Chalcedon. But these views don't mean that you're unsaved automatically, because God is gracious. God doesn't save according to our wisdom, according to our knowledge, according to our theology. He doesn't look at our minds and see, does this person have perfect theology? He looks inside the heart. Have we truly repented? Have we humbled ourselves before him? Have we trusted in the Savior fully for our salvation and not in our righteousness? Because that's pride and arrogance and self-righteousness. But I would say denying the true humanity of Jesus Christ is extremely serious, but denying the deity of Christ and the real identity of Christ as eternal Son of the Father, as our God and Creator, this is even more serious, and you need to repent of that sooner rather than later, or your soul would be in jeopardy.